The rising cost of everything is hitting people hard. You have a fire and the government's solution is to throw kerosene on top of it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. The burden of this will not fall, certainly not on my generation, maybe even on your generation, but it's going to fall on, on future generations. How far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Well, just watch me. Everything in Canada just keeps getting more expensive as the price of groceries, homes, and especially gasoline continues to spiral out of control. But what exactly is causing all this inflation and who should Canadians blame? Has the federal government spent and borrowed too much money? Has the Bank of Canada kept interest rates too low for too long? And is Canada on course for a long, painful recession similar to the 1980s before new leadership can begin to turn the country around? They are utterly incompetent or they are deliberately undermining the mandate that they have set out for them. My name is Aaron Gunn and this is Politics Explained. As Canada's inflation rate rises, some food prices are seeing double-digit increases. Soaring cost of living, with inflation hitting its highest point in nearly 40 years. The cost of everything will continue to go up over the next few months. For many Canadians, life in this country is becoming unaffordable. Prices have skyrocketed, and the most essential goods and services we need to live our lives are increasingly out of reach. In other words, inflation, it seems, is spiraling out of control. But what exactly is inflation and how is it measured? To answer that question, I sat down with economists, policymakers, and thought leaders to find out what exactly is causing this historic increase in prices. People hear inflation, they see the rates, going up in the news, in the headlines, what does that actually mean? It means a, 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 a rise in prices of a basket of goods that the average Canadian household buys. The headline uh, inflation is the consumer price index. And so there are thousands of, of goods that are sampled by Statistics Canada uh, and then basically creates an index of what the average price is. And so inflation is the percentage change in this index. Uh, in the last year, for example, almost 70% of the components of the consumer price index have risen by more than 3%, significantly more than the Bank of Canada's target. And that doesn't even include the real estate inflation, which has been much higher. Um, it's been go, running at around 25% annually for the last two years. Uh, that's not included in the CPI. But even without things like housing, the rate of inflation calculated by the CPI is staggering. In June of 2022, the annual rate of inflation in Canada hit 8.1%. This is the highest inflation rate since 1983, nearly 40 years ago. I wanted to know how Canadians are coping with these rising costs, so I met with the owner of the Lion Rampant Scottish Pub in Maple Bay, BC, to discuss the real impact inflation has had on his business and his customers. I mean, with, uh, with inflation the way it is, I mean, costs just go up across the board, everything from our products to our utilities to all our overhead goes up because of inflation. And it's, uh, there's not a lot I can do as a small business owner other than pass on those costs that I incur yeah. to the customer. Uh, do you have any examples of that that you can show us, different goods that have, that have gone up over the last uh, couple months and years? Yeah, absolutely. I've got uh, eight or 10 products I can show you right now. Okay, let's go. Perfect. So products as simple as, as bacon. Bacon has gone from you know $39 for a five kilogram uh, box to, to $79. And ham, ham, which is one of our, you know, it's a product you have to have, sliced ham, and that's gone up 25% just in the last two years. And how much has this gone up in price? That went from uh, $19 uh, two and a half years ago to $79. So we're no, talking nineteen dollars to seventy nine dollars over over two years. Two over two years. years. Yeah. As your prices increase like this, do you have any choice but to pass that on to the end consumer? Like how much you can't have that much margin. No, to deal with. there is no margin. I mean we, we went through two years of pandemic and mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to get from the red back to the black. Mm -hmm. And then all these costs go up, I have to yeah. pass it on to the consumer and you get to the point where there's only, you know, so much someone will pay for a pint of beer or a burger. Yeah. 
and it's not just food prices. Over the last year, the price of used cars are up 34.5%, house prices are up 20%, and gasoline is up a whopping 48%, hitting Canadians hard every time they go to fill up their tanks. So how bad has it gotten for Canadians? And should we be concerned? Should Canadians be worried about the rising level of inflation? Deeply worried. Um, people can't afford the cost of living. Uh, inflation's almost three times wage growth, which means folks are experiencing a real wage cut. Inflation really has become one of the key economic issues facing Canadians' day-to-day -day lives. You go to the gas pump, you fuel up, and then you gotta check your bank account before you go to the grocery store to buy the package of ground beef. So the immediate problem is you've got single moms who skip meals so their kids don't have to, working guys who can't fill up their tanks, and of course 32-year-olds living in their parents' basement because of house prices. Um, and that means that life sucks for a lot of people right now, to be perfectly honest. At an inflation of 5%, this costs the average Canadian person, individual, not household, the average Canadian individual $2,000 a year. But as an economist, I also have to note it creates a lot of problems for the economy in the long term. Businesses become reluctant to invest because they don't know what the future profitability and uh, cash flows are going to be. So uh, it's it creates uh, longer-term problems for investment and productivity as well. Both the short and long-term effects of inflation are very serious, especially considering the tight financial situation in which many find themselves already in. In fact, 53% of Canadians are only $200 away from not being able to pay all of their bills and debt obligations. With so many on the brink of insolvency, the pressures put on households from inflation risks pushing countless Canadians over the edge, leaving them only to ask, how did this happen? What's caused this inflation and why has it gotten so bad? We have lowered our target for the overnight rate by 50 basis points to 0.25% to provide support to the Canadian financial system and to the economy during the COVID-19 pandemic. In March of 2020, the Bank of Canada lowered its interest rate to one quarter of 1%, the lowest it's been in history. This meant commercial banks could borrow from the Bank of Canada for next to nothing and by extension, offer similarly low rates to Canadians as well. This was done to incentivize Canadians to take out new loans and spend more money. The thinking being to stimulate the economy and prevent what at the time was expected to be a deep recession during COVID-19. This action of adjusting interest rates to affect market conditions is called monetary policy and is controlled by the Bank of Canada, theoretically without influence from the government. Monetary policy mostly adjusting interest rates is a tool to stay is a short term stabilization tool. When the economy starts to overheat, it is the fastest way to, start to cool down the economy. Uh, similarly, when the economy is weak, uh, we saw that the central bank can lower interest rates overnight. On top of dropping interest rates to historic lows, the Bank of Canada also took another unprecedented step, injecting billions of newly created dollars directly into the Canadian economy through the purchase of massive amounts of government debt. This is called quantitative easing. The Bank of Canada implemented something called quantitative easing, which is a fancy way of saying they buy government debt from the secondary market. So what happens is when the government earns a deficit, it sells bonds to the private sector. The private sector buys the bonds and that the purchase price constitutes the money the government borrows. The bank has then been buying those bonds back at a higher price. So first of all, that profits the financial institution. But what happens though, is that when the central bank buys that bond, it pays for it by putting a deposit in, a, in the financial institution's account at the Bank of Canada. Just like you would have a deposit at CIBC, TD, well these banks then have deposits at 
the Bank of Canada. At any time, they can contact the Bank of Canada and say, I would like you to send over Brink's truck mm -hmm. and uh, give me a, a million dollars of uh, bills. But the Bank of Canada, as the sole manager of the Canadian money supply, purchases these bonds with newly created dollars, causing the total amount of money in circulation to increase. The way the Bank of Canada prints new dollars out of thin air is by buying financial assets. And one of the key financial assets that the Bank of Canada purchases to create these new dollars is Government of Canada debt. It is figuratively money, money printing in the sense that it vastly expands the money supply. And it is literally money printing in the sense that financial institutions can and do receive payment for the bonds they sell the central bank in the form of paper cash. And so there literally is a printer cranking out bills. Mass money printing is not a new phenomenon. Governments and central banks throughout history have experimented with cranking out newly issued currency and the effects have been fairly consistent. After the First World War, the Weimar Republic in Germany paid its war reparations through the mass printing of new banknotes. The result of this was hyperinflation, with a loaf of bread in Berlin that cost 160 marks in 1922, costing 200 billion marks by late 1923, just one year later. The same thing happened in Zimbabwe, after years of printing money to fund its war effort in the Congo. It experienced hyperinflation that peaked at a surreal 89.7 sextrillion percent in November 2008. But where does all this leave Canada? Just how much money has our central bank created in the past few years? The government central bank has printed $370 billion, right? Sure, there's many things that influence prices, but one of the key things here is that you have the, the government central bank printing dollars out of thin air, and of course the government can't print houses out of thin air, so you have this inevitable inevitable problem where you have too many dollars chasing too few goods because the government's printing press has been on overdrive. One every five dollars was created in the last two years. Wow. So, you know, and then people take that cash and they go and buy stuff and they bid up prices and you have 6.7% inflation. From December 2019 to December 2021, M2, which is a measurement used to track the total money supply in Canada, increased by 28%, the result of record low interest rates and an unprecedented level of quantitative easing. But by increasing the amount of money in circulation, without increasing the amount of goods or services that money buys, all that results are bidding wars for scarce resources like gasoline, labor and homes that, as a natural consequence, inflates the price of everything else in our society. It's for this reason that if the government printed enough money to give each Canadian a million dollars, you wouldn't actually be creating any wealth. You'd simply inflate prices with potentially devastating, destabilizing effects on the economy. This concept is easy enough to understand, which begs the obvious question. How did the so-called experts at the Bank of Canada fail to predict the consequences of their actions, especially as they began to overshoot their target inflation rate of 2% as early as March 2021? The Bank of Canada has a mandate to keep inflation at 2%. That's the mandate they have. Either they were deliberately violating their mandate or they're utterly incompetent and financially illiterate. I warned back in 2020 that this was going to lead to galloping inflation and all of them said, no, 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 that's simplistic thinking. Money printing doesn't lead to inflation. That's all the, ex all the all experts, the experts told us this wasn't going to happen. In fact, the experts said we would have deflation. Uh, something that hasn't, <laughs> not even come close to materializing. Yeah. This is a failure of massive proportions of central banks. Uh, why the Bank of Canada wasn't more uh, alert to the inflationary possibilities of this increase in the money supply is a very good question. Should the Bank of Canada, in your opinion, have increased interest rates sooner or quicker? Yes. Yes. I mean, in retrospect, it's easy to say monetary policy over the last two years has been horrendously mismanaged. Do you think the government and the, and the Bank of Canada, who's 
stated mandate is to keep inflation at 2% or less is kind of drop the ball? Absolutely. I mean, I think the Bank of Canada has failed us. We should never have inflation at 7%, 8%. It's just, it's ridiculous. But Canada's high inflation rate isn't the result of monetary policy alone. Canada's fiscal policy, or how much the government chooses to pump into the economy by running deficits, has further exacerbated the problem as well. Inflation is fueled by two things. One, money supply growth, and the other, large deficits. We had both in play during the pandemic. And I mean, we're talking about a massive deficit, $145 billion deficit in the fiscal year 2021-22. So these are some really eye-popping numbers. You know, even as the economy is overheating, even as we're trying to slow down spending, you know, half of governments out there are busy shoveling money out the door so people can keep spending more. You have a fire and the government's solution is to throw kerosene on top of it. I mean, that's what that's what continued excessive spending does in times of inflation. Well, wait a minute, that's, that's what led to the problem. So <laughs> doing more of it is not a solution. I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And instead of financing these deficits by borrowing money on the open market, as is traditionally the case, the government has been financing them using the aforementioned printed money meaning the Bank of Canada has simply been creating new dollars through bond purchases for the government to spend. By, by buying government bonds, the Bank of Canada is essentially financing government spending with no cost to the government. The government doesn't have to tax to get the money, so it doesn't reduce private sector spending. What's wrong with the Bank of Canada just continuing to buy government bonds for one thing, we get inflation, yeah. and inflation is a tax. It's a tax on consumers. So it really seems like Ottawa is financing a good chunk of its deficits with the printing press, which means that Ottawa is financing a good chunk of its deficits by eroding the value of your money. That's the inflation tax. The average Canadian, I think, would have told you that paying people $2,000 a month to sit home and do nothing probably was going to create unintended consequences, not good ones. So what we saw here in Canada is we saw the government create the perfect storm for inflation. Too many dollars chasing too few goods. But deficit spending leads to more than just inflation. It also balloons our national debt, something Trudeau originally promised to get under control. How committed to a balanced uh, budget would you be right now? Would it worry you to go into deficit in this current climate to, as you say, put more people to work? The, the commitment needs to be uh, a commitment to grow the economy and the budget will balance itself. Now, if I recall, though, when Justin Trudeau was elected, he, he promised, I believe, three years of deficits not exceeding $10 billion and then a return to balance. Now, that didn't exactly happen, did it? Yeah, it didn't exactly happen. And it turns out uh, the budget doesn't exactly balance itself. And, and remember, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau initially he said he would run a few modest deficits, then balance the budget in 2019. Uh, but he missed that target by a country mile. Instead of balancing the budget like he promised, Trudeau has been running huge deficits year after year, including before the pandemic, peaking at $314 billion in fiscal year 2021 and driven almost entirely by record levels of new spending. What's more, according to the parliamentary budget officer, under the current fiscal trajectory, Trudeau is not on track to balance the federal budget until 2070, nearly 50 years from now. But all this borrowing begs a very obvious question. Just how large has our debt become? So Franco, what is this giant clock here? Can you tell everybody what we're looking at? It's our brand new national debt clock. And as you know, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we've been uh, taking a form of the debt clock across Canada since the 1990s to sound the alarm over runaway deficits and debt. And, and you mentioned it's a brand new debt clock because when I was at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we are also touring a debt clock, but it looked quite a bit different than this. So why did you have to 
you know, spend all the money and get, a, and get a new one. Well, short answer, the Trudeau government broke our debt clock. The last one that we had, it just wasn't big enough. It didn't have enough digits to display the full $1 trillion in debt federally. That number is going up by about $400 million every single day. So this is gonna be an expensive conversation that we're having. But here's a big important part of it, right? Your share. Right now, each Canadian is already on the hook for more than $30,000 in federal government debt. So, and this is, so this is all government debt, provincial government? No, this no. is just federal. This is just federal. Just, so it's actually higher than this? It's actually higher than this. If you were to add provincial government debt on top of it, uh, on average, it would go to about $57,000 per Canadian. And all this debt, well, it comes with a cost. A cost that extends well beyond its measurable impact on inflation. This year alone, taxpayers are losing out on about $25 billion just to pay the federal government's interest charges. That's $25 billion that can't be used to hire more nurses or it's money that can't stay in Canadians' pockets through lower taxes because that money is going to the bond fund managers on Bay Street just to pay the government's interest charges on the debt. And while $25 billion in taxpayers' money wasted on interest payments might seem like a lot to most Canadians, in reality, it's likely about to get even worse. That's because in a belated and panicked attempt to cool inflation, the Bank of Canada has begun raising interest rates dramatically. In March of 2022, two years after dropping rates to their historic lows, the bank doubled its interest rate to 0.5%. Since that time, they've steadily overseen a consistent increase in rates, with the largest jump taking place on July 13th when they were hiked from 1.5% to 2.5%. This means that the annual interest charges owed by the government, not to mention individuals with variable rate mortgages, are now expected to increase significantly. That we can hardly make the interest payments on this. What, what if the rates went higher? I, I think it instills a fear into you of debt that, that the, the current generation of politicians and, and even business people don't have that haven't lived through that. With all the debt they issued during the pandemic, they're very vulnerable to even small increases in interest rates are going to be very costly. And that could lead to billions of dollars, I guess, in additional interest payments that everyday taxpayers have to pay? Very much so. Put it this way, the interest rates that they were forecasting, that the highest interest rate they could possibly consider, we're already past that. Yeah. So you can just throw those forecasts out the, out the window. Yeah, interest rates have been low, but look what's happening now. We are spending $74 million every day, just the federal government, on interest payments. $74 million. Think where else that could be invested or where else that could go. That's not a responsible use of tax dollars. And I tell you, that number is going straight up. We are seeing history repeat itself now. The impact of rising interest rates on the Canadian economy is not just theoretical. It's something we've seen before. In fact, the situation we're currently in is very similar to one Canada has already faced. How bad was the debt and spending problem in Canada in the 1980s and into the 1990s? Well, it all started early, right? It starts in the 1970s. They started to borrow money and they started to borrow money more into the 1980s. And eventually it starts to catch up with you. What you had in the last Trudeau government was massive money printing throughout the 70s that led to 12% inflation in the early 80s, and they had simultaneously had 12% unemployment. When Pierre Elliott Trudeau first took office in 1968, Canada's budget was essentially balanced. The economy was strong and inflation was low. But over the next 16 years, under Trudeau's leadership, government spending exploded and the national debt increased by over six times, leading inflation to spike to 12.47% in 1981 and forcing the Bank of Canada in an unprecedented attempt to bring inflation under control to hike interest rates to over 21% at the cost of a severe recession that crippled the economy. Unfortunately, the consequences of this economic mismanagement would linger on for years to come. And by 1993, 25 cents of every dollar spent by the federal government went toward paying interest on the debt. 
Unfortunately, due to pressures exerted by voters, the Reform Party's Preston Manning, and the very real possibility of Canada defaulting on its debt, John Chrétien, a Liberal Prime Minister, enacted deep spending cuts and would finally balance the budget in 1998, ending 27 consecutive years of deficits in Canada. The Liberals didn't just flatly disagree with the objective of balancing the budget, that eventually that had to be done. Whereas today, I, I don't see any acknowledgement from the federal government that this overspending is printing money. I don't see any, uh, any objection to that at all. Uh, As someone who was so actively involved in that time, it has been heartbreaking to see the absolute train wreck of fiscal policy that's been undertaken in particular by this government over the last number of years. It is reckless, it's irresponsible, um, and they, they could learn a lesson from Paul Martin and some of the former Liberals that came before them. For many Canadians, there is no issue more pressing than the rise of inflation and how it has impacted their daily lives. From being able to put food on their table, gas in their tank, and a roof over their head, the dramatic increases to the cost of living have left many Canadians reeling and struggling to afford the quality of life they've come to expect. But whether the situation will yet get worse before it gets better depends. Will the Bank of Canada abandon its policies of easy money and unplug the printing press before it's too late? Will our politicians finally wake up to the reality that spending and borrowing more money not only doesn't help inflation, it actually makes it worse? And will the policies that are desperately needed to bring this crisis under control, including higher interest rates, lead to a long, painful recession, the likes of which we haven't seen in 40 years? Uh, what do you think? the most likely outcome for Canada is in the months and years ahead and do we have a potentially uh, kind of a rough road to, to economic uh, recovery? Oh I don't think there's any question we're going to have uh, some difficult times. The idea that we could have had a, a free lunch during the pandemic, that we could spend all this money and we could borrow it all at zero interest rates and it was somehow there would be no consequence to this. The bill is coming due. You know in the extreme it means the Weimar Republic. It could mean the collapse of society. I mean, you have people who have uh, racing around looking for other ways to exchange goods and services because money, fiat money, is worthless. The burden of this will not fall directly on, certainly not on my generation, but it's going to fall on, on future generations. And this is, in, in a sense, taxation without representation. In the end of the day, if you can't meet your obligations, you can get into an enormous amount of trouble, you know. It is a moral outrage that the kids at my son's age, my daughter's age, are going to inherit this $1.2 trillion federal debt uh, that they had no part in voting on. So that's the danger, and the only way to confront the danger is to stop creating cash and start creating more of what cash buys. Um, bring in a, a, a policy of, of spending restraint um, so that we can balance the budget quickly and then unleash the productive forces of our economy. My name is Aaron Gunn, and this has been Politics Explained.